Yeah. I... Okay, perfect. So first of all, welcome to this new session of our course. Today's session will be about the cornea cases discussion. And as a matter of fact, when I was preparing this class, I was thinking that it will be a walk in the park and it's, it will be easy since that uh, this is my own subspeciality. However, I found that it is extremely difficult to, to like distinguish what is important for the exam and what is important for the real practice. And uh, like it will be like there is things in common, things are different. So it wasn't an easy task as it looks. So I will try to focus mainly on the um, what is needed for the FRSS exam. I will try to avoid the scarce of knowledge that I talked about earlier in the orientation lecture. So to give you the uh, important information relevant for the exam. So let's start with, as we know, as we as usual, how let's first say where is this session is asked in the FRSS exam. So. In the Viva station, you will be asked in the anterior segment station. So there is a dedicated station for or dedicated section for the anterior segment where you will be asked about this session, asked about the cornea. In the OSCE exam, in the previous times, it was, there was again another uh, session or another st specific station for the anterior segment. So you will sit on the slit lamp, examine the patient's cornea, and tell the examiner what are your findings. Now, in the current time, with the video stations and the video uh, uh, video uh, video uh, exam, you are unlikely to be asked <laughs> the video of the <laughs> Please mute your mic. I will mute you all. Okay, so that's much better. When, when we are talking about the video exam, you will be unlikely to have a video of the cornea, like those the examiners uh, wanted to ask you in videos, in cases that really video is needed, like in the strabismus or in neuroophthalmology. But for the cornea, just a photo or a picture is enough. So you will be asked either in the in the in next online exam, you will be asked either in a photo, the presenter or the examiner will show you a photo and ask you to comment on. Or you can be asked about clinical scenario. So the examiner may not present you a photo, but ask you a direct question uh, about clinical scenario and asks you what is your approach or what are your answers. Okay. So this is like a, a brief introduction about what will be, uh, how is this session is asked in the exam. Let's now uh, go deeper into the cornea. And first of all, as you know that I would like and I love to, uh, to share and to tell you how things are like, to give you a common approach or um, the origin of how things start. So when you are thinking about the cornea, it is the same approach that we talked about in the neuroophthalmology, which is how, where, where is the lesion and what is the lesion? These are the questions that will give you a clue about diagnosis. If you know what is, what is the level of the lesion or where is the lesion in the cornea and know what is the lesion or what is the character of this lesion, by combining these two data from to each other, you will reach a diagnosis. So how can we know where is the lesion and what is the lesion? Let's start first by where is the lesion? How can we know where is the lesion? Well, by examination techniques that we talked about the last time. So these the different examination techniques we, we talked about in the sit lamp lecture, like diffuse illumination, direct focal illumination, literal illumination from the iris and the others. So which one or which, uh, which group of these examination techniques are particularly useful for examination of the cornea. Well, diffuse illumination, this will be the start. This will be the first thing that you are doing in your examination by broad illumination to, to examine the total cornea. Then when you find a lesion of interest, you do direct focal illumination, parallel piped examination, and optical section, depending on the surface of the lesion and the depth of the lesion. 
But if you found a lesion that is subtle, that you cannot detect it very clearly, then again, you do retroillumination from the iris. So these are the three standard examination techniques for the cornea. Retroillumination from the fundus in direct proximal illumination are not frequently and not usually used for the cornea, but the specular reflection and sclerotic scatter are again used for cornea. Like specular reflection is used for examining the corneal endothelium. Sclerotic scatter is used to examine and check for subtle corneal opacities. However, we don't do them on routine practice. And for the exam as well, like if you are examining in a real case, in a real life scenario, you don't do this as a routine, but you just request or, or you are doing, you do these examination techniques upon request. When the examiner told, tells you examine the corneal endothelium, then you ask about or you request to do the specular reflection. To ask it to, if the examiner told you to do the sclerotic scatter, then you do the sclerotic scatter, but you don't do it without request. Okay, you got it now. These are two examination techniques are important for the cornea, but we don't do them except upon request. So if we do these examination techniques, how can we reach the lesion? So where is the lesion depends on that the cornea is is like if on five layers, starting from the tear film epithelium junction, you will find that the tear film epithelial junction is a slightly hyperreflective. So this will be the first layer that you will detect. And then beneath the epithelium, just below the epithelium, there will be the starting the stroma, which appears, appears more grayish or more translucent. So it will not be very hyperreflective like the epithelium. And uh, so the epithelium uh, stromal junction is a very important zone, which is a subepithelial zone. Sometimes there are subepithelial infiltrates and other lesions that can, can occupy this zone and dystrophies as well. Then the, mo the, the entire depth of the cornea, uh, like 90% of the depth of the cornea is made by stroma. So you should also notice where if, if the region is anterior stromal or posterior stromal. And lastly, the, the last hyperreflective layer will be the endothelium and the dismids. So it's also important to detect if the lesion, uh, where is the lesion, like if there is a dystrophy present in the level of dismid membrane or in the endothelium. So this will be the, your half way of reaching the diagnosis. So without knowing where is the lesion, you will lose a lot of marks and a lot of, uh, and you will miss a lot of cases especially the dystrophies, because the, to detect the, the, the anatomical level of the lesion is very crucial to reach a diagnosis. So what happens if you know, if you detect a lesion and you know that it is like subepithelial or it is anterior stromal or it is epithelial? So what is next? The next in order to reach a diagnosis is to know what is the lesion or the pathology of the lesion. So you know now the anatomy. Now the next step is to know what is the pathology. If you think about the pathology of the cornea or pathology of lesions affecting the cornea, you will find them, they will be one of these six criteria or six, six categories. It, the lesion can be a defect. The lesion could be a defect, for example, and the, not only a defect, also the, 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 the tempo of the disease, like if it is acute or chronic or resistant or recurrent or persistent, this also can give you clue about diagnosis. Like if the defect is acute, you may consider epithelial abrasion. So you ask a patient about history of contact lens use, ask about history of trauma. If the, it is acute again, then could be a dismiss break. So ask about history of trauma again and history of uh, history of so you ask about if there is history of trauma for this must break and history of acute heart drops. So if the patient has history of keratoconus, if he is already well-known cases or well-known case, or if he is uh, accidentally discovered, so ask about frequent change of glasses. 
So all these can give you clue about diagnosis. So acute break, acute break in the epithelium, acute break in the dismiss or in the dismiss break or acute hydrops. The second thing is if the, this uh, defect is recurrent, like if you find a defect in the epithelium and the patient report a frequent um, pain and recurrence of the problem, especially when the patient is uh, opening his eyes, so you are thinking of recurrent epithelial erosion. If the defect is persistent, think of herpes simplex virus. So this virus is a, it's epitheliotropic and will cause persistent epithelial defect. It can be either in virgin eyes or it can be present in post-surgery, like post-keratoplasty with patients. One of the commonest reasons of, of persistent epithelial defect after keratoplasty will be the herpes simplex virus. What else could be the lesion? It could be fibrosis or vascular, vascular process or vascularization. Like if the, the repair or if you find the cornea has fibrosis, if you found the cornea has vascularization, this denotes the chronicity. This denotes that the, the process is chronic and there is repair. The, the patient has a, like any corneal insult that, and then the fibroblasts are trying to fix the cornea and make the cornea uh, restore its integrity. So this de denotes that the patient has a corneal, uh, the, the, the patient has a corneal repair process and this can take a longer time and the density of the scar itself will change over time due to remodeling in the collagen. So this is like uh, when we are a resident, so when you are seeing a cornea with a lesion, a, a very common mistake that the resident will say, okay, this is a corneal opacity. There is nothing called the corneal opacity. You have to define what is this opacity. It is a scar, it is infiltration, it is degeneration, it is dystrophy. So you should, you should know by, by the characters of this opacity. So if you find that it is like if there is scarring, the, the cornea is thin, like if you have a, a, a scar, then the cornea will be thin. So, and if there is vascularization, so this thinning and vascularization will denote that there is scarring and mostly that the cornea is in the healing process now. Also, the lesion could be edema and this edema could be focal as in epithelial bully or it can be a, like epithelial bully, like in case of pseudophytic bullous skeletopathy, you will find that there is bully of, of, of the epithelium. The next thing, if the edema is diffuse, it can be due to a lot of things. If it is diffuse epithelial edema it, and the microcystic edema, it could be due to acute rise of the intraocular pressure. If it is a stromal edema, it can be due to a wide range of reasons such as uh, disiform keratitis. So lots and lots of reasons or the lesion can be immune process or immune response. For example, immune response to exogenous uh, material or in exogenous factor like infection, as in case of herpes simplex in herpes and disiform keratitis. There is infection caused by the herpes simplex or herpes zoster and resulted in infection, resulted in autoimmune process with autoimmune reaction endotheliitis due to autoimmune process. That's why it, since even though it is a herpetic uh, in origin, but it is treated by a steroid. Or the endogenous, it can be due to autoimmune process like in cases of peripheral ulcerative keratitis caused by wide range of autoimmune systemic disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis, Wigner granulomatosis, systemic lupus, and the others. So the lesion here in the cornea also has some specific characters. It will be peripheral because it will be close to the, uh, the blood vessels at the limbus where uh, the source of autoantibodies are coming. So again, by knowing the, uh, that, that this is an underlying immune response, you will know how even how will you treat this patient. The lesion also can be deposited. Like if there is exogenous deposits coming from outside, like drugs, for example, the amiodarone causing the, um, the cornea verticillata or vortex keratopathy, or endogenous like copper, which is deposited in the Wilson disease in the cornea. So the source of deposits can be coming from outside or from inside of the body. Finally, the lesion could be a proliferation. Like if there is any abnormalities in the growth and the maturation, 
such as hyperplasia or dysplasia or neoplasia or carcinoma in situ, like patients with carcinoma in situ involving the nasal limbus and invading the cornea. This is very common. Or it can be ectopic migration, as in case, in case of epithelial downgrowth after refractive surgery as LASIK or after uh, extra capsular cataract surgery on penetrating keratoplasty, you are implanting epithelium in a sub-epithelial uh, place leading to proliferation of sheets of epithelium. Or it could be stem cell deficiency. It could be a stem cell deficiency, like leading to the conjunctiva will creep over the corneal surface as what happens in case of chemical burns, in case of Steven Johnson syndrome, ocular secretion of All these can be characterized by conjunctivalization of the corneal surface. So this will be because of the loss of the barrier between the cornea and the conjunctiva. Okay, so this is a very brief overview about what are, uh, about how to approach a case of a cornea, how to think, how to, um, to analyze the condition as if, uh, as, as if you are analyzing case of neuro or strabismus, you are putting the clues together in order to reach diagnosis. Okay, so let's now start our discussion by the first case, and I need my first volunteer. So please raise your hand. Okay, Dr. Ramya, I will give you the mic. Yeah, hi. Hello. Hello. Okay, so are you ready for the first case? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so the, the first case is very, very, very common in the exam and for the practice and in everything. You will be hitting over it wherever you are practicing, wherever you are in the exam or in the real life scenarios. So let's start with this one. Mm -hmm. Please comment like an examiner now and please comment on this photo that, that I'm presenting to you right now. So I should uh, describe what I'm seeing, yeah? Or uh, yeah, you... yeah, exactly. So as I oh. said in the orientation lecture, when you see a picture, want to jump to a diagnosis, just describe and give differential yeah. diagnosis if possible, and then by uh, see for, ask for more clues about history and others that to reach a diagnosis. Yeah, uh, there is uh, conjunctival uh, uh, injection and chemosis. Uh, uh, there is uh, corneal opacity, and uh, with uh, with a clear margin. Uh, and there is uh, corneal uh, uh, haze and anterior chamber uh, hypopion. Uh, uh, now, can I ask or uh, I should ask the doctor or what uh, I should do? No, you should now, after you, after you describe, you should uh, list your differential diagnosis. Uh, okay, so uh, first uh, I uh, should ask if uh, any history of uh, contact lens. No, you are now giving a workup. No, I'm asking ah, about okay. what is just to list your differential diagnosis. Yeah, uh, uh, we can say bacterial, uh, bacterial keratitis okay. or fungal keratitis. Okay. Uh, And acantamoeba, uh, no, sorry. Uh, herpes keratitis. Are you sure that herpes can present like this? No, 
no, not herpes because uh, there is hypo hypo hypokion. So only bacterial and uh, fungi. Okay, so how can you reach a diagnosis? How would you work up this patient? Uh, I would like to do uh, uh, to ask if uh, the, about the history, if uh, there is a contact lens uh, use or any uh, history of trauma. Okay. And okay, so there is no contact lens and no trauma. What else? Uh, Uh, any uh, uh, any uh, cornea uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, disease, uh, any uh, past history of ophthalmic disease? No. What else? And any uh, systemic disease. Okay, the patient doesn't have control any control systemic disease also. Mice. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any uh, use uh, of uh, steroid? Yes, the patient was on steroids for long term. Uh, okay. Uh, so I uh, think more about fungi. So also, first, I first I would like to do uh, smears and uh, culture. Just a directly smear and the culture with nothing first. Would you like first to examine the cornea itself? Yeah, the... I would like to examine the cornea. So what would you like to examine the cornea for? Uh, I want to see if there is a corneal uh, defect. Okay. And to see uh, anterior chamber, if there is a flare, uh, no, and, and inter, uh, uh, intraocular pressure. And to see if there is uh, uh, vitritis, to see uh, uh, the vitreous, and uh, to check the fundus. What else? And also check visual acuity. First, uh, I should check visual acuity. Okay, so you told us something about doing a cornea scrapping. Can you tell, tell me, please, how would you do this cornea scrapping? Uh, by uh, cut, uh, by a cotton swab, we start from uh, the in, uh, uninvolved area to the inside. Uh, from the edge to the base. Do you know any other uh, you, uh, methods or any other tools that you use for doing the cornea scrap? Except the cotton, uh, cotton, uh, uh, the cotton or the sterile cotton? Uh, by a blade. Okay. Which kind of blade? A spatulated one. Okay. And, and so after, after you obtain the specimen, where do, would you like to, or what would you like to do with it? Uh, to do culture on uh, for uh, culture for uh, aerobic for non uh, non and uh, for uh, fungal uh, and do also uh, uh, 
stain, stain, uh, gims, uh, gram stain, and gims uh, stain. Okay. Okay, first, so, uh, first okay, the so stain, then the culture. Okay, so you sent the patient or you sent the, uh, the, the specimen for gram stain and gem stain and for culture, as you mentioned. So how will you treat this patient? Would you, like, would you wait for the, the results to appear? No, I will start uh, fortified antibiotic. So can you tell and me what are these fortified antibiotics and what are the dosage? Uh, we, uh, it is... Uh, uh, Tobramycin 45 and uh, quinolone as uh, gatifloxacin or lipofloxacin. So gatifloxacin are fortified drops? Uh, no, we are uh, not fortified. So what are the fortified eye drops that you are using? Uh, Tobram. And Vanco. So the topromycin for gram negative or gram positive? For a gram, uh, uh, for a gram negative. And the Vanco, uh, positive. Okay. So do you know the dosage or the, the concentration? Uh, no, unfortunately, I forgot. Okay. So what else apart from the fortified eye drops that you would you like to offer for the patient? Also, we uh, give extra uh, the, uh, the um, uh, quinolone uh, uh, medicines, extra to this, or cefazoline, sorry, cefazoline. It is topical or systemic? You are giving cefazoline topical or systemic? Uh, at 45, we can prepare it. So why you are giving cefazoline? You are already giving to promycin and vancomycin. Okay. Uh, so we give, uh, we can give uh, also superfluxacin uh, uh, systemically. Uh, Seven hundred. Would, would you think that in this case, this the superfluxacin systemic will be effective? In this case, uh, I don't think because uh, maybe I probably think it will be fungal. So, uh, but uh, until the culture result will appear. So maybe why do I you think that this patient has fungal keratitis? Uh, because uh, there is history of long uh, use of steroid and uh, also the appearance of the of the answer that uh, it has a clear uh, margin. So if the patient has ulcer with clear edge, it, this yes. means that it is fungal? Uh, uh, if it is, uh, it is due to steroid, maybe it could be because uh, there is uh, two kinds of uh, fungi. Uh, one of them with feathery edge, and uh, when uh, as uh, 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 as apparent uh, age. Okay. So let's say, for example, that you started your fortified drops, and now the um, the, the culture and specimen tells you that this patient has mixed fungal and bacterial infection. So how will you modify your treatment? I will uh, cover him with uh, antibiotic, uh, fortified antibiotic, uh, as what well. Is, what, what is the frequency? Uh, every one hour, drops every one hour, uh, plus uh, antibiotic uh, systemic. And uh, we can also give him antifungal, uh, 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 drops. What is the kind of antifungal drops? We can give, uh, we can give uh, natamycin, eye drops, or uh, also we can give uh, him uh, 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 
ketoconazole or uh, fluconazole. Okay. And, and also we can give him uh, systemic. Okay, what happens if the patient is improving? What will you do? If he improving, uh, we can uh, see that the size of the ulcer uh, decrease and the epithelial defect improve. And also the anterior chamber, the uh, hyperpion decrease. And his visual acuity will improve. Okay, so these are the signs of healing. And so will you continue the same treatment? No, I we will uh, decrease it. Change it or decrease it? Uh, decrease. Okay, so let me ask you another question. If the patient has the uh, culture report showing that it is, um, it is a fungus, it is only fungus, However, you are giving the patient the treatment of, and there is no bacteria, in, no bacteria is involved here, and you are giving the fortified eye drops, and you see that the patient is improving on the bacteria. What will you do? Uh, so sorry. The patient, uh, the patient is improving on the fortified yeah. antibiotics. However, the, the report of culture and sensitivity is saying something else. Would you go with the clinical or would you, would you like to change your treatment according to the culture and sensitivity? Uh, I will continue with the treatment and uh, I can take culture again, uh, uh, swab and smears again and repeat it, but continue until the result uh, appear. Okay, uh, so the patient received the treatment and he disappeared for a long time and he returned it back to you with this picture. Can you please describe what you are saying? There is vascularization uh, uh, to the cornea, uh, so, and uh, scars, severe congestion, congestion of the conjunctiva. What else? Uh, what uh, what about uh, is uh, about the pain and visual acuity? The visual acuity is hand motion, and there is pain. What is the most important here to check for? Uh, we can check for uh, if there is a perforation uh, because uh, there is, uh, I see that the iris, uh, the anterior chamber is uh, uh, shallow. Maybe there is perforation and uh, then vascularization, vascularization and fibrosis. So to how will you make sure that there is a perforation or not? Uh, we can uh, do a, a sidal test. And what is a sidal test? Uh, we put the uh, fluorescein uh, uh, on the cornea and then we can see uh, when we, uh, uh, we uh, do pressure uh, uh, on the lids, uh, there is like leakage. Okay, so you did the saddle test and it was positive. So if uh, it is positive uh, and uh, where it will be in the central or uh, peripheral? So where do you think it? that, where do you think here, like where is the thinning and where is the it perforation? Should be, it should be central here. Okay, so how would you uh, manage? Uh, first, we can uh, put uh, contact lens and uh, 
continue with the medication. And uh, if uh, because uh, the uh, visual acuity is low, so we can uh, we can uh, we can do uh, uh, conjunctival uh, conjunctival uh, 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 transplantation as Gunder son tram. So for this kind of perforation, it is like around 1.5 millimeter to maximum of two millimeters. So you think that the flap so, it will be the best suitable option here? No, because uh, it is a small one, less than two millimeter. So we can uh, put uh, contact lens uh, and do uh, lateral tarsography. Lateral tarsography? Yeah. For this small, very minute perforation? If you don't know, just say, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, we can put the glue uh, if it is less than two millimeter and then uh, put uh, contact lens. Okay. Let's see, show, let me show you another case. So yes. this patient is presenting to you with very severe pain and history of contact lens use. What, please describe the picture. There is a corneal opacity uh, with a ring uh, corneal opacity. Uh, And the other cornea the, uh, is clear. Okay, what's your differential diagnosis? Uh, hydro, uh, hydrops. The patient has severe pain and history of contact lens use. I can tell you about keratitis. What else? Uh, bacterial keratitis. Okay, please check the patient's cornea. You found this picture. What do you think is this lesion? Uh, nerves, uh, nerves of the cornea. And what is the lesion here? I can tell you it should be. Yes, can you please describe the sign? Uh, there is uh, a cornea ring opacification. For the other photo. Uh, uh, there is the uh, engorgement uh, of the cornea nerves. We and say engorgement for blood vessels, not for nerves. Ah, uh, okay. So what is the problem with the nerve here? I don't know. Okay. Can you please tell me if this patient has acanthamoeba keratitis? How can you treat this patient? Uh, we can give him uh, uh, chlorhexidine uh, or and hexamethine biguanide, and we can give him uh, systemic uh, conazole, ketoconazole, uh, for uh, long term. If this patient is improving and she has now no pain, would you advise her to go to, to do, uh, and she is complaining of drop of vision, would you advise her to do penetrating keratoplasty immediately? No, because uh, it uh, sometimes uh, recurrent on the, on the graft. Do you know how much is the percentage of recurrence on the graft? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And okay. let me just give you some notes about your answer. Okay, as I told you, this is the one of the very, very common cases and is considered one of the emergencies that you should know every single, every a tiny detail about the cases of infective keratitis. Uh, doctor, uh, uh, 
you have been uh, you you answered the most of the answers correct however you was very hesitant like you say don't say ever to the examiner we can do we can so we can this is this is you are treating the patient now you have to be very strict in your answer like you should do you should say i will do cornea scraping then i will examine uh, the uh, check one two three or i will perform a b c don't say we can we can give the possibility that you are don't know what don't know what you are doing and this also gives the clue that you are not sure of your answer and didn't have never done this before so you are just repeating the theoretical knowledge present in the books and this is the last thing the examiner wants to hear from you so be very specific be strict be uh, always uh, always use the letter or use the word i not we so you should examine the patient or you should do what uh, the exact thing you as if you are examining this patient in your clinic okay so let me start with the first case or the first photo so we all start by observation so by observation what we can see here we can see a congested eye or an injected eye with the cornea showing a central opacity. As you said, a central opacity, it looks like elevated and it looks like you have always to measure the corneal lesion. So you said, you would say, how can I measure the corneal lesion? I don't, I am not sitting on the sit lamp. You already know that the horizontal diameter of the cornea is like 12 millimeter and the vertical diameter of the cornea is around 11.5 millimeter. So it is 11.5 uh, in the vertical diameter, 12.5 in the horizontal diameter. So you should examine and you should compare the length and the width, the height and the width of the lesion comparing to the horizontal diameter of the cornea. So for example, this cornea, it looks like around six millimeter per six millimeter. As it, as it is like almost a half of the uh, vertical diameter and also half of the horizontal diameter. This is important. So I would say if I were if, if I were in your place, I would say that there is a central rounded stromal infiltration in the cornea. It is measuring six millimeter per six millimeter. It is white sheen color with well defined edges. And the, uh, I need to, uh, I, I can't judge over the epithelium over it because I didn't stain with, or I can't see, I need to see, see it on the blue filter, but, uh, but uh, I need it and so that I can check if there is any epithelial defect or not. It is, this lesion is surrounded by stromal haze and also there is hypopion. This hypopion is measuring around four, four millimeters and there is the lens looks clear the rest of the cornea looks clear and the uh, so this will be your full comment on this case and then what will be the, your differential diagnosis your differential diagnosis will be that it is an infective keratitis for differential diagnosis why because you see a central stromal infiltration you see a hypopion and yes exactly what i saying there is also the smith's faults and you see that this, this patient has uh, a pain uh, or this patient has redness. So you are considering your infectious causes as your first priority. Dr. Maj, no, there is no neuritis here. These are just the dismiss faults. All these are dismiss faults. Okay, so this will be your first comment and the differential diagnosis will be infective keratitis. It could be bacterial, it could be fungal, and it could be a cancer amoeba, by the way. So you don't just stick to the uh, stereotypical image of the cancer amoeba presenting with a neuro, a neuro infiltration or present with ring infiltration. No, a cancer amoeba, fungi, and bacteria can, can be very, uh, uh, give a picture very looking to each other or they are look like the same to each other. So you have you are still considering all, but this is unlikely to be viral. The viral will be unlikely to present with this dense suppuration with the stromal infiltration and the hypopion. 
Uh, so this will not be our first concern. However, it could be a viral complicated by secondary bacterial infection, but this will be excluded by the examination as I'm going to show you right now. But from the photo, no, I can't say that it is viral. Okay, so about the management, we will discuss this now. I'm just, I will describe the photos for you right now. For this photo, this is like vascularization. There is like a 200, you also should say this, the extent. So it is like 270 degrees uh, vascularization all around the cornea. The cornea is reaching, uh, or the vascularization is reaching a central scar in the cornea measuring around four to five millimeter in the vertical and in the horizontal dimensions. And it looks like a whitish, uh, with uh, with a regular margin, and there is an area in the middle where, where there is um, there is brownish pigments, and mostly it is an iris pigment which is impacted into an perforation. So I would like to check for the sedal test or sidal test. I would also like to check for the presence of shallow anterior chamber. Check for the intraocular pressure. Or if there is a soft intraocular pressure. So if these are present, and this should be, uh, I would, I must say to the examiner that I would like to check for this, because if you didn't say this, you will fail in this station. So the CETL test is positive. It will show the Green River sign by the fluorescein strip. And, and then what will you do next? Also, we'll talk about the management of the perforation in a while. Regarding this photo, what we can see here, there is a ring-like infiltration in the cornea, and there is scattered central uh, multiple uh, focal or multifocal opacities present at the level of mostly it is, in, in, is in the stroma. And so this will be also can be bacterial, can be fungal, can be uh, canthamoeba. So again, don't try to reach a diagnosis by just the shape. You are giving a differential diagnosis of infective keratitis, and all can be present with each other or with each other, or a, the, the clinical picture can be very deceiving. So when you see this picture or the examiner show you this picture, you will see that there is an area or of, there is, a, a, there is this is a, a corneal peripheral nerve and the nerve is infiltrated. The nerve is swollen and it is not engorged, we are saying that the nerve is thickened, but it is not, we don't say it is a visible corneal nerve because we only are saying visible corneal nerve, we are meaning that it is a normal corneal nerve. So visible corneal nerve can occur in keratoconus, can occur as a normal variation. So we say that it is a perineural infiltration or keratoneurites or a perineurites, okay? So there is a perineural inflammation of the um, of the peripheral nerves, which means that this patient is mostly acanthamoebic keratitis, and we will discuss the management now. Dr. Kirtana, how to check the uh, uh, how to check the intraocular pressure in perforated case? There, it will be mainly by digitally. Simply by digitally, we will know if it is um, a perforated, if it is soft or not. But we don't. Uh, Put uh, any uh, device like a planation trometer or others. No, we don't do that. NCT, what do you mean by NCT, Dr. Navid? Well, it depends if you have it in your practice, you can do it. But for me, I don't have it, unfortunately. So if you have any other, any non-contact method, you can do it. But please bear in mind that any uh, method that you are using will be uh, not very accurate because if the patient has a stromal infiltration, thickness of the cornea will affect the measurement. If the patient has thinning, the thickness of the cornea again will affect the measurement any method that will not be very accurate. So you are trying to depend, you are trying to depend on uh, your clinical judgment rather than to touch the patient. 
or to use any method for measurement. Like if you have a shallow anterior chamber and you have like the iris is bulging or plugging the defect. So yeah, this will be like a, a spot diagnosis. Yes, Dr. Muhammad Islam, that's what, what I was mentioning. That we don't need intraocular pressure in perforated cornea ulcer. Like this will be a spot diagnosis or a clinical diagnosis, even without measuring the intraocular pressure. Okay, so let's now discuss the management. How would we manage a patient with corneal ulcer? First of all, when we have a, a patient with corneal ulcer, we check the, the location. The location is very important. We see, you remember when we said, where is the lesion? Where is the lesion is important in terms of corneal ulcer because when we have a central corneal ulcer, the more central, the more, the more we are likely to think about the infective causes, the more, but there are exceptions. And the more peripheral, the more we go toward the limbus, the more we think about systemic diseases. So the, the more we think about autoimmune disorders, but again, there are exceptions. So I'm, say, I'm just saying about the probability or how much the corneal lesion or the, the, the disease will be, or what will be the percentage of being infected or being non-infectious in origin or autoimmune process. So like our patient, he has a central corneal ulcer. So after I'm ruling out systemic disease, and how would we uh, rule out systemic disease? Starting by the history. What would, like, what would we like to ask in the history? Onset and the course and duration. Very important, and you missed it. This is your first question in any case in ophthalmology, not only the corneal ulcer. When did the condition start? And is it increasing or decreasing? And what will be the duration? This is important to know what will be the natural process of the disease. Like, for, let me give you an example. If you have a patient who has been, uh, is, is being suffering for one month and, she, and he is busy, didn't receive any treatment, would you like to consider a uh, consider a pseudomonas, for example, if this patient has contact lens use? What do you think? If this patient that I'm presenting to you has been uh, treated for one month or is not even treated for one month and is coming to you now and he has contact lens use, I would never consider a uh, Sorry, I would never uh, consider pseudomonas because pseudomonas is a very severe condition. It doesn't take that time, that much time without perforation. It will be very aggressive. It will perforate the eye. So it will not stand or stay calm like this for one month. So duration is very important. It will give you what will be the natural history of the disease, okay? Uh, and, it, and it will give you what will be the most likely condition that caused this problem. Another example, let me tell you, like if you have a patient who is now contact lens user, and again, and he is now presented to you after one week of a stoppage of contact lens after he felt pain in his eyes, and you didn't find any clue of ring infiltration, would you consider that or would you exclude a cancer amoeba? No, we cannot exclude. We cannot exclude a cancer amoeba because it, it, like in the cancer amoeba in the early stages, it will give, uh, it will show very few signs in relation to symptoms. So these patients will show severe pain. However, there are no clinical signs. Sometimes this is, uh, wrongly diagnosed as herpetic because of the appearance of pseudodendrites. So the full blown picture, the, the, the ring infiltration, it takes like one month or so in order to develop. So again, course and the duration are very important to ask about in order to know what is the nature of the organism that affecting or the cornea, causing the cornea ulcer. The second thing is the recurrence. Why is the recurrence is important? Can you tell me? in terms of central corneal ulcer or a patient with corneal ulcer. Which corneal ulcer or which kind of herpes. infected keratitis is characterized by recurrence? Herpes simplex. Herpes simplex. Yes, exactly, it's the herpes. So recurrence again is important. Trauma, history of trauma. Trauma can predispose to any kind of uh, uh, infective keratitis. 
especially speaking about the trauma with agricultural matter, like trauma with wooden, uh, with wood or, or any, or, or a branch from a tree will give rise to the fungal keratitis. So that's why we are asking also about the personal history. Like what, what, will, what is the nature of uh, the, the, the job of the patient or what is his uh, career? Like if he, is, if he is in the agricultural matter, like if he is uh, if it's a farmer, then you are considering not only the fungal keratitis, but also the acanthamoeba. Like the acanthamoeba is not only exclusive to those who are contact lens wearers but acanthamoeba can be present in the canals, in the water of the canals. So if they are uh, washing their heads or face with unclean water from these canals, this can result in acanthamoeba. The past medical history with systemic diseases, uh, speci especially the diabetes or any history of immune suppression, like use of any immune suppressive drugs, history of re uh, recent renal transplant, the history of contact lens use, also can predispose to uh, any kind of infective keratitis, steroid use as well, and the anti previous antimicrobial use. I also should inquire about that, as the previous antimicrobial use, if it is not responsive, so I may consider another diagnosis. So now you know what will be the history. What, would, what should I ask the examiner or ask the patient? What will be the main items of the history that I should inquire about? Then we will proceed to the examination. So first thing, let me, uh, let me just stress on that. We need to document. You remember when I told you we measure the size of the ulcer, we measure the size of the epithelial defect, we measure the size of stromal infiltration, we measure the size of the hypopion. So the documentation is very important because when you are following up this patient, you will not remember how much the ulcer was or what, will, what was the dimensions. So you should draw or you should document. Then you do very, very important step. Don't ever forget to test the corneal sensation before any case of keratitis. Like if, uh, because herpes simplex ha or herpes has a lot of variable presentations. So this uh, by uh, the only way to differentiate or to exclude the presence of herpes is to test the coronary sensation. If you have diminished coronary sensation, you are considering viral or herpes infection. Then you then you stain the, stain the fluorescein and as a general rule, you don't do fluorescein staining with binox in the cornea clinic. You are putting the fluorescein strip. So you are measuring the, uh, you check if the patient has a sensation with the, maybe with the fluorescein strip or with, with a cotton. And then, then you are staining for the presence of epithelial defect. So what are the signs that are present in the, when I ask do Dr. Ramia, what are the signs that you are checking for in the cornea that can give you clues about the, the, the origin or the, the, hist the, the, the pathology, which is infection. So you should consider the, first of all, the pedal no, uh, mnemonic. What is this pedal? It is the presence of pain. Again, pain can be present in both uh, infective and non-infective. Like a non-infective can be very present in more in ulcer. But pain is can exclude if the central ulcer is more uh, infective or there is no infection. Epithelial defect is also very important. Like if the patient has a stromal infiltration due to uh, infection, mostly that there will be a break of the overlying epithelium. And this will also uh, will guard uh, or will, 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 will tell us the response to treatment and tell us how would we interfere and how will we add some adjunctive treatment such as steroid. The discharge, if there is discharge, like for example, the pseudomonas has characteristic soup discharge. It is like soup. It is mucopyrrhal discharge. Anterior chamber reaction also, but be aware that the anterior chamber reaction doesn't always have to be from the infection. It can be a reaction from, from inflammation. And also this is important to, to, to say or to think when we add steroids for some cases. Local infiltrate, the like stromal infiltration, which appeared as whitish or grayish or yellowish material present in the cornea in the stroma. 
which will cause corneal thickness. And this is very important when uh, my residents ask me, I am sometimes confused about uh, how is it, the, if there is an opacity in the cornea and in, in, in the course of a corneal ulcer, and I don't know if it is an infiltration or if it is a scar. So simply look at the thickness. Like this, the infiltration will cause thickening of the cornea, while the scar is a con is a contractile tissue. It will cause a thinning of the cornea. Doctor Rosana, what type of discharge in pseudomonas? It's called a soupy discharge. It is like, let me just write it, soupy. It is like soup. Mucoperitoneal discharge. You know the soup you are washing your hands with? I will just send you a picture in the in the group uh, after the after the lecture to see to tell you what it looks like the the, the aggressive picture of the pseudomonas. Okay, so there will be also infiltration and regarding the investigations. So you are now documented the case. You are you are now suspecting infectious origin, which mostly is a bacterial or fungal or a amoeba. So you would like to do investigation. What will what are the investigations that you will do? You do corneal scraping. So how would we do the corneal scraping? This is a common question in the exam, and I am going to show you in a, in a while. Then you do you take this scrap and you spread this scrap over uh, three slides for staining for aerobes and aerobes and fungi and also you are, uh, you, you, are you are placing this in a broth uh, in order for to do culture and sensitivity and for some resistant cases where you you have nothing to scrap where the lesion is posterior you may consider a corneal biopsy and this this is common for fungal cases the lesion tended to be more posterior, tended to break the dismiss membrane, and this will be the, uh, so when you are trying to just scrap the cornea, the, the epithelium, you don't find anything. And finally, the management, how would you manage? So you start your management immediately by antibiotics. You don't wait for the result of uh, scrapping and staining, and you, uh, you give the uh, fortified antibiotics. Then, and let me just post upon this. I will tell you about it later. So you are giving me the topical antibiotics. You are giving, these are topical. Like in this patient with the central corneal ulcer, when you are giving a systemic antibiotic, well, it will not be effective. The, the, the lesion is central. So no rule for the systemic antibiotic here. You may consider it for cases of peripheral ulcer, but for central ulcer, no rule. The cycloplegics, So Dr. Muhammad Islam is saying about there is a hypopion. So this hypopion is mostly the trial hypopion, Dr. Muhammad, is from the reaction. So the, the, the trick here that this hypopion will respond not, not to the uh, antibiotics part, but to the steroids. But you don't give a steroids if there is epithelial defect. This is like, I don't want to uh, just make the case more, uh, more branched, or I don't want to. Uh, distract you, but let's just to focus on this case, okay? So we are giving antibiotics and this cycloplegics to decrease the reaction, analgesics for pain and steroids. So the steroids can be given in some cases, like if the patient has, um, there is a famous, a famous trial called the SCUT or steroid for coronary ulcer trial. And this is this trial showed that there is uh, there is will be improvement in the inflammation and the pain for the patients with infectious keratitis, mainly the bacterial. So the 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 the, uh, the trial was done for bacterial keratitis. So when we are giving the steroids, we are giving the steroids if the patient has a, like improvement. If the uh, if the patient has improvement, first of all. Like if the patient to show signs of improvement that we are going to discuss now, and there is inflammation, there is anterior chamber reaction, there is hypopion, despite the improvement in the clinical condition. Like if you have a patient, if this patient, let, let, let me show you this patient again. For me, when I saw that I see this patient, I will say that this patient is in the healing process. Why? 
First of all, the conjunctival injection is not intense and the, inf the edge of the infiltration is well defined. And mostly that this hypopion is, is a reaction. It is not infection. So if you find that the patient clinical condition is improving with the stromal infiltration is improving and becoming well-defined edge and the, and the pain is improving. However, there is very large hypopion expected that this hypopion is not, uh, is not infection. It is a reaction and it will not improve except with the cycloplegia and for steroids. Okay. Difference between what, Dr. Maral? Admit the patient right, Dr. Majd? Well, it depends on your practice. Like for in my practice, we don't ad, like we don't admit the patient. We don't have inpatient. Uh, so uh, the coronary ulcer can be managed out. Uh, it, both are correct. If you want to admit the patient, you can. If you want to manage the patient as outpatient, but with close follow up, like every two days, you can also. We didn't say we didn't reach the the, uh, the perforation, Doctor Kersana. We still we will discuss the perforation in a while. Your your question is just too early. Okay, so let's back to the management. So, would you please explain? Would you please explain again the difference between a steril hypopion and infectious one? It will be based on, it will not be based clinically. It will be based on the, the or it will not be based on the appearance of the hypopion itself. It will be based on the clinical picture of the ulcer overall. If you find that the ulcer is healing and the epithelial defect is closing with the edge is, is becoming well-defined, stromal infiltration is decreasing in size and in thickness, and the, the patient reports less pain or improvement of pain, but you still find that there is infiltration. Then what's a, a common mistake here is that the doctor is just increasing the frequency of the medication in order to make this hypokin disappear, but it will not disappear. It's just a reaction. And instead, you just add steroids. If you add steroids, just in very small dose or very small frequency, two times per day, you will see dramatic response in this hypokin. So as, soon as, as, as long as it is improving, the ulcer itself is improving, you can add steroid. Don't be afraid of that. Well, steroid we can give when there is, a, uh, epithelial, there is no epithelial defect. Even the, in the epithelial defect, we can give the steroid. Well, it is not advisable. Like if you are not a cornea uh, specialist, don't do this. Um, uh, so it just, it just because sometimes the, 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 the steroids can make can, can give rise to um, reactivation of herpes causing epitheliitis. So if you are not a cornea specialist, you may, you may not be able to detect epitheliitis present at the edges of the epithelial defect uh, in the early stages. So you may find you, this will result in that this epithelial defect will not heal. Okay, so just stick to the, uh, to the, the rule for general ophthalmologists, just give the, just give the steroids uh, after control of the inflammation. Like the, the inflammation is not only due to infection, but due to other factors, other uh, proteolytic enzymes and other, uh, and other mechanisms. So these steroids will address that. And this can be done for bacterial. For fungal, it is, it is controversial, but for me, I give steroids and, in the antifungal and I, uh, with the antifungals in specific cases, but not for every case. And I see very improvement, uh, very much improvement with the steroids. For epithelial keratitis, we don't use the steroids. For stromal keratitis with the herpes, we can use the steroids. Uh, what is the frequency of steroids? It's two times per day, two to three times the maximum. You are just, <laughs> I will come to the treatment. Don't, uh, don't rush the treatment, okay? I will still discuss the treatment. Okay, so we have three scenarios. Like if the patient is improving, what will you do? The, the patient, you will continue the treatment, even though if the results of the cultural sensitivity are different. 
if the patient is deteriorating, then you are stopping the treatment and you are uh, and wait for 48 hours and do risk wrap for maybe you have a wrong diagnosis and also consider it uncompliance. The patient may be not compliant to treatment. And also consider the toxic, medic toxic medicament dosa or consider that the epithelial defect or toxicity from the drugs. So if you find that the patient has punctured epithelial erosion, uh, widespread, consider that this is a toxicity from the preservative of the drugs, especially the antifungals. So you, you can stop the drug and uh, give preservative free uh, artificial tears. Or if the patient is proceeding to complications, and by complications, we mean that if the patient proceed to endophthalmitis, so you can do the ultrasound. If the patient proceeds to the uh, perforation, we will discuss the perforation right now. Dr. Ihsan say 48 hours without any medications. Well, if you are excluding that the patient is non-compliant, then your diagnosis is wrong. So what will be the purpose of the medication? The patient didn't improve on these medications. So your medications are not correct. If there is any kind or any signs of improvement of the of, of medication, then you are continuing on these medications. Because sometimes if you are giving, you are doing the culture under, uh, under medications, this can suppress the organism and it will not be evident in the culture and sensitivity. Okay, so how can we do the cornea scraping? This can be done by several tools. First of all, the chimora spatula. This is a spatula called the chimora spatula. We can do it. We are putting topical anesthesia over the cornea. And then we are, you can use a speculum to open the eye or you cannot, depending on uh, your comfort and on your patient's comfort. Then we are scraping the cornea. specifically from the edge and from the base of the ulcer. Gentle scraping of the edge and the base of the ulcer because these are the advancing edge. And here we are putting it in the broth for culture for both aerobes and anaerobes. Spread it over a blood agar for again for culture and sensitivity. Chocolate agar for hemophilus and myceria and moraxella. McConkey for gram negative rods. Sabaru agar for the fungi. And then we also spread them over slides for gram stain and for gem stain. So this is how we do the corneal scraping. We can, if we, and of course, dispose any, use the needles or instruments after you finish. If you don't have chimora spatula, you can do it with the 15 blade. The 15 blade also can be used for scrapping. And if you're not present, we can use a hypodermic needle. It will not be like this needle. This is like large bore needle. For me, also, again, in practice, we, are, we can sometimes use it. Uh, but if you are not cornea, if you're not a cornea specialist, don't use this large bore needle. I tried to find some picture for uh, insulin needle, but I couldn't find. But uh, so you know, you have three instruments, the chemoda spatula, the blade 15, and the hypodermic needle or the insulin needle. And you do it from the edge and from the base. Let's now discuss the treatment. When you have an anti, uh, when you have a patient with uh, with infective keratitis, 
the standard treatment is the antibacterial treatment. Like if you are not very confident about the diagnosis, so you start the antibacterial. But if you have a, a clue that can, can tell you that this patient is a amoeba, then you give a specific amoeba treatment. If you have a clue that this patient is fungal, like if this patient is a farmer, is, is, is traumatized by agricultural matter, if the patient has feathery edges or satellite lesions or heaped up eye hypopion, or if the lesion is posterior, so you are giving the antifungal from the start. But we don't give the antifungal without the antibacterial cover. So you give the antifungal with the antibacterial. Okay, because the, the, the picture of the bacterial and fungal keratitis are very similar. Okay, so you, you, you got this concept. If you have a patient with infective keratitis that of unknown etiology and of unknown origin, and you don't know what is this, you give the antibacterial as standard treatment. Then you modify the treatment according to the result of culture and sensitivity. But if, you, if it is evident that it is fungal from the start, you give antifungal and the recover of antibacterial. Okay. Okay, so the antibacterial, this all depends on the appearance of the lesion. If the lesion is small, the more the quiet the lesion, like if it is a small, if it is, uh, if it is peripheral, if it is uh, the epithelium over it is not broken. So it is more likely that you are giving the fluoroquinolones monotherapy. Just to give the fluoroquinolones, uh, the, the gatifloxacin, the moxifloxacin, every two hours, you can start in the first day with every one hour. Then if there is improvement, you are decreasing the frequency to two hours in the next visit, and then you follow up the patient. And as the patient is improving, you are decreasing the frequency of the antibiotics. So here is the thing in ophthalmology, we are not like general medicine and other uh, and the surgery and the other branches where we are fixed to typical dosage uh, depending on the half life of the drug, but we are more concerned with the response. So we are increasing or decreasing the frequency. Like if they have a patient is receiving, uh, has in skin infection and he can receive penicillin, we don't increase giving a, a, a pill of penicillin every two hours or every, or we don't give like a, a, like a injection of intravenous injection of antibiotic every two hours. We don't do this in other subspecialities. But in ophthalmology, we can do this depending on the, on the response. So we can increase the, 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 the drug on response increase the dosage depending on the therapeutic response, and we decrease also depending on the therapeutic response. So we start with the one hour uh, and then make it every two hours. And we uh, this is for small ulcers. For large ulcers, we are like this one that, that I presented, we present fortified antibiotics. So it is one of the main uh, drugs that should be memorized for the exam is the fortified eye drops. All antibacterial and antifungal and the acanthamoeba treatment should be memorized by dosage and by concentration. So for the fortified antibiotics for gram positive, we are giving vancomycin 50 milligram per milli or cebazoline 50 milligram per milli. Any one of those. And for the fortified antibiotics for gram negative, we give ceftazidine 50 milligram per milli or aminoglycosides such as tubromycin uh, 14 milligram per milli. Okay. So we, st we start this treatment and we monitor the response of the patient. We, so we see, we check if the, uh, there is improvement or not. Again, if there is no improvement, then we are considering I I either the non compliance of the patient or the patient, or if there is wrong diagnosis, or if there is toxicity from the medications. So what happens if the report showed, if the patient didn't show improvement and the report showed as common, showed mixed infection between bacteria and fungi, then we add the antifungal. Depending on the report of culture and sensitivity, uh, we, uh, we give the, uh, the antifungals accordingly. So for yeast keratitis, they responded to topical fluconazole 1%. For the filamentous fun, uh, fungi, uh, such as aspergillus, will respond to the topical natamycin 
And also we give a systemic antifungal such as etroconazole or fluconazole 200 milligram three times daily. So this will be the standard treatment for the, uh, for the fungus. For the acanthamoeba, we are, the acanthamoeba treatment is much more difficult and it takes long time. So we shouldn't uh, offer the patient keratoplasty immediately after improvement as those patients will mostly harbor the cyst of this organism. And this cyst will be impacted in the deepest trauma, which will cause more recurrence, more incidence of recurrence up to 30% in the, in the graft. So what are these treatments? The topical biguanide, such as chlorhexidine 0.02% and the polyhexamethylene biguanide 0.02%. So we give one drug of these two. We give also the topical diamidines, such as the probamidine isothionate, which is 0.1%, or the proline eye drop, or the hexamidine eye drop. So these are uh, prepared uh, drugs. So we give one topical biguanide, one topical diamidines, and one systemic antifungal, such as itraconazole, fluconazole, uh, uh, itra, uh, the clotrimazole, myconazole, all these are systemic antifungals. So uh, actually the acanth amoeba is treated as amoeba and fungus. Dr. Muhammad Islam, how long the antifungal treatment we can continue as long as the patient is improving? Sometimes it takes one month, sometimes it takes two months. So it will be, it will be as long as the patient is improving, you give the antifungal treatment. If the patient is not improving, then you are considering other alternatives. So you can offer him therapeutic keratoplasty, you can offer him cross-linking, a lot of options. So the systemic itraconazole is 200 milligrams, three times daily. We give two eye drops for the acanth amoeba. Usually, yes, we give two eye drops for the um, chlorhexidine and the proline. And also we give them under cover of systemic antibiotics. So we give also like uh, moxifloxacin eye drops uh, together with these two drugs. So we cover the amoeba, the fungi, and the bacteria. Usually, if the acanthamoeba is diagnosed correctly from the start, and it will show good response, but if it is late in diagnosis, as, as it usually happens, then it will be more resistant to treatment. Should one talk about all the signs and the clinical features, even though not asked about? Clinical signs and features of what doctor measured? Of acanthamoeba. Okay, so acanthamoeba, it is not like, let me um, uh, just try to summarize the acanthamoeba for you. It is not like you will find all the signs at once. It is like stages. There is stage one with epithelial infiltration, there is stromal infiltration with perineural. So at the stage of epithelial infiltration, there will be like the epitheliitis with the strom with the, with the pseudodendrites, then the epithelium will break down. Then as it will go deeper into the stroma, so there will be perineural infiltration and there will be the uh, patches, stromal opacities. Then as the organism is impacted deeper and deeper and it will cause the ring infiltration. So you see that it is not like you will find the ring infiltration in every case. You will not find the pseudodendrites in every case. It depends on when did you see the patient. So you are, a, you are um, that's why, that's what make this organism difficult it, uh, to diagnose. If sometimes I saw a lot of patients, even some of them of deny the history of contact lens use and others with no history of contact lens use at all. And uh, it turned it out to be a cancer amoeba. So you don't tell, tell the examiner everything. You don't tell the examiner all the signs. But you, if he, if you have, a, if he presented to you a photo, then you would, um, if you want to tell the examiner that you already know these signs, you make them in the form of questions. I will check or I will check for the presence of pseudodendrites 
or I will check the presence of ring infiltration or perineular infiltration. So the, the examiner will, 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 will now consider that you know these signs, but you, you don't, you don't, but they don't have to be present in the patient, don't have to be present in the patient's eye. Uh, so you only describe the clinical signs that you saw you, or you see in the photo. And if you are in sus suspicious or if you are suspicious of acanth amoeba, then tell the examiner, I am, sus am suspecting the acanth amoeba, which can uh, present with A, B, C, D, A in the start, then it will proceed to, uh, to, to uh, B, then it will proceed to C. So, <clears throat> And when the examiner asks you about what are the signs of healing ulcer, it will be decreased the pain and the congestion and the consolidation and the sharpening demarcation of the edge of infiltrate. This is very important. The base of the ulcer will be clear, but you will not be able to appreciate that, but you will see that the edges will be show sharper demarcation line. So let me show you a case that I treated. This is my patient. So this patient present with no history of anything nothing like no contact lens use no uh, no uh, systemic disorders no trauma nothing with with this stromal infiltration so what can you see here that there is a stromal infiltration it's about two millimeters and you can appreciate the depth here you can see that the it is elevated the cornea is thickened and uh, so what what happened or what, what did i give this patient the patient has the stromal infiltration not, not affecting the visual axis it's more peripheral no anterior chamber reaction no hypopion and the epithelium over it is intact so i give her the uh, fluoroquinolone like give her moxifloxacin every two hours and three days later she presented to me like this you see now what is the change of this the character of this ulcer it is now becoming more scarred it is now becoming very well defined, but unlike this, the thickness itself be not becoming thick, it's becoming thin now. So the, and actually this is this whitening, it is just an epithelial plaque. It is epithelial plaque rather than a stromal infiltration. So the patient show improvement and all the pain improved. There is no pain here uh, right now. And the, and the patient is satisfied. After three days, she presented to me, or in the next follow-up, you can see that the density of the uh, scar even is, is, is decreasing. And then she was lost to follow-up, so she was, she was satisfied and she was improving, and she didn't come to me later on. As uh, the, uh, and I expected that if she passed like months or two months, this scar will be very, very faint, okay? Because of the collagen remodeling. So this is what's meant by a, a, a healing ulcer, like decreasing stromal edema, decreasing endothelial plaque and hypopion, decreasing anterior chamber reaction. So all the manifestations will point to that this patient is healing. So if the patient is healing, you continue on the same treatment. But what happens if the patient is not healing or if there is perforation? So how can we manage a perforated ulcer? Well, again, the, uh, the this is an emergency you should tell, tell the examiner that this is an emergency you can say that i will admit the patient but it depends on your policy there is no fixed rule here some hospitals admit some hospitals doesn't admit so the management of the uh, perforated ulcer mainly depends on the size the shape the location and the cause of the lesion whether it is infection or not so, uh, but as a general rule, the medical treatment, you start your management by medical treatment. So you give the patient the topical antibiotics, uh, you continue the patient's topical antibiotics and systemic antibiotics if the perforation is near the limbus and give the anticollagenase such as tetracycline. So we don't give tetracycline for its antimicrobial effect. We know that it is bacteriostatic. However, we're giving it for its anticollagenase effect. So it will prevent further melting of the cornea and, and, and increasing the size of the perforation. So this will be the treatment for the perforated ulcer or even impending perforation. 
We also very important to, to give is the aqueous suppressants, especially if the patient has dysmetocele. Like if the patient has dysmetocele with the dysmets uh, bare, is bare, so this patient is at, at risk of rupture at any time. So uh, the, the dysmets will uh, bulge and bend against the intraocular pressure. We need to decrease the intraocular pressure uh, for those patients, especially that many patients of the perforated ulcer, they have a corneal touch, so they develop peripheral anterior synechia, and they develop rise of the intraocular pressure. So we need to decrease again the intraocular pressure to uh, avoid the increasing the equus or the increasing the incidence of equus suppress equus uh, equus leakage and the increase the incidence of endophthalmitis and phthisis. Also, we give bandage contact lens as a temporary measure uh, until we give the patient a definitive management. We give them a bandage contact lens to try to compress the cornea and stop the leakage. Adjuvant treatment such as vitamin C can be given as well. We, 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 give, we give it to um, promote the collagen synthesis. And if the patient has underlying systemic condition, like if the patient has perforated ulcer secondary to more in ulcer or uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis caused by rheumatoid arthritis, then systemic immunosuppressive here will be very important as a part of the management of perforated ulcer. So this will be the initial medical management. However, the treatment is surgical. We are just giving the medical treatment as a uh, for impending, so if the patient has impending perforated ulcer, we can give them medical and, and, and with very, very close follow up and ask the patient to put a face uh, and eye shield to prevent the perforation. So an impending, per, impending ulcer can be managed conservatively by medical. However, if the patient has already perforation in this emergency and they need to be managed surgically. So how can we manage the patient? It will, we have a variety. Yes, someone has the mic. Let me. Okay. I close it. So the, the choice of the surgical management will depend on the uh, the wide range, as I told you, uh, of, of, of factors, like what will be the size, the shape, the location, the cause of the region. But the most important in the choice is the size. How much is the size of the defect that you want to close? For example, if it is small, like one to two millimeters, then the surgical method, the least invasive will be the tissue adhesives, like the cyanoacrylate blue and fibrin blue. And there are a lot of difference between them and whether it is central or peripheral. So cyanoacrylate is better for the central, fibrin is better for peripheral, cyanoacrylate is better for, uh, for, bacteria, for infectious causes as it is, has antibacterial properties. Fibrin glue is not suitable for the bacterial causes because actually the bacteria will, will, will flourish on the fibrin. Uh, so uh, also there are many factors that will control which one of those we are choosing. The, if the lesion is defect, if the defect is larger, like if it is like three millimeters or maximum of uh, like two to three millimeters, which is not suitable for tissue adhesive, then we are considering a conjunctival flap or a magnetic membrane graft. And again, everyone has its pros and cons, but they were, you are unlikely to be asked in this in the exam. The tectonic co and then if the defect is larger, like more than three or four millimeters, then you can do a tectonic cornea graft. A tectonic cornea graft is just a graft to close the defect, but not for vision. The patient, you are just an emergency case and you are just closing the defect by a corneal tissue. And, or you can do a scleral patch graft if the, if the patient, if a corneal graft is not available, then you can do a scleral patch graft. Okay, so let me show you some of my cases, maybe. So here is a tissue adhesive. You can see that there is a central perforation here. It is like one millimeter. And for the patient has shallow anterior chamber. And we put a tissue adhesive here. This tissue adhesive plugging the defect until the cornea under the defect will heal. And then this, uh, this uh, tissue adhesive will be peeled off. It will peel off naturally by itself. 
So this will be done for small perforations. For a larger perforation, we can do the conjunctival flap. So let me show you for the, this, my patient. This patient has a perforated cornea ulcer. You can see this, you know, you see, this is the iris coming out. And what is this? This is the cornea. The cornea is melted and dislodged like this. So when this patient presented to me, I had I didn't have any corneal tissue, and this is an emergency, as I told you. So I did him a conjunctival flap, a sort of a rotational flap, and and expect what? I, as I was expecting that to, to happen, that when this patient has uh, when I will put the conjunctival flap and the anterior chamber form again, uh, the flap will not be stable in its place. So this is what happens when the anterior chamber is forming. Anterior chamber is formed. The, so the the all the iris is pushing against the flap, causing this uh, dislodgement of the flap. So, and and since this patient has total corneal defect, and the also the conjunctival flap is not suitable for total conjunctival uh, corneal defect, as I told you, it will be uh, it will not withstand the effect of the intraocular pressure. So, but I, I had to do this because I didn't have any other option. So, eventually, this patient received a corneal scleral graft. The cornea sclerar graft for uh, because she didn't have a rim of cornea to suture, and eventually uh, we put the cornea and sclera from another patient into the patient's eye, and she's doing fine. Another option is if the problem with the conjunctival uh, graft that or the conjunctival flap that it will sometimes if the patient has cornea, it will invite vascularization to the cornea. So if we don't want to invite vascular, and, but it has advantage of bringing also antibiotics from the blood vessels. Uh, the aminotic membrane graft can also act by uh, helping the, to, to heal the cornea by the uh, healing factors present in the aminotic membrane. The aminotic membrane can be done using several methods. Uh, there are what's called inlay and overlay and this and the Swiss roll uh, uh, implantation of the amnitic membrane graft. But uh, for the amnitic membrane graft, we don't remove it. We, do, we just wait. We want to the amnitic membrane to stay in its place as much as possible. Usually it resolves and dissolves around one month after uh, the cornea heals behind, below it. Finally, if we have a large defect, and if we have a patient, uh, or if we have already corneal tissue present, then we can uh, offer the patient tectonic graft. Like for example, this patient as well, she is uh, having a, a central infiltration, and the central infiltration, I was afraid that this central, this central infiltration will progress to the limbus. So I thought, uh, and uh, this central perforation, yeah, she had this infiltration and then she developed a central perforation. So, and she was not responding to the medical treatment. So I, I thought to give her an opportunity by doing here a tectonic graft. So to remove the cornea, to culture it and to preserve the integrity of the eye. But she presented with this perforation acutely. So I did her this, um, this tectonic graft. And you can see that the graft here is opacified. Why it is opacified? Because actually it was a graft I, that I took from another patient. This, the patient has this corneal scar. So I did him, the other, for the, the other patient, I did him optical keratoplasty. And for this patient, well, uh, for this patient, well, did her take the, the graft from the first patient and implant it in this second patient. And for this patient, now we close the defect. So it's a tectonic graft. And later on, the patient received optical keratoplasty. Dr. Mustafa, one, what will happen if they reach the limbus? Well, first of all, the healing will be poor. Like if you, when you are now trifying the cornea, then a part of the cornea you are trifying is not healthy corneal tissue. It will be just an, a, a corneal tissue with a stromal infiltration and inflammation. So the healing will be poor. More incidence of recurrence in the graft. So these are the, the, the main two problems. So there will be a recurrence of the infection in the graft, and the graft may not to heal uh, from in the first place because of the presence of stromal infiltration. So it is like a rationale. When you are having a patient with perforation, you are thinking, should I uh, rush to uh, a graft 
or should I give the patient opportunity for treatment to provide, uh, to, to improve the survival of the graft, the next graft? So every uh, corner surgeon is thinking like that. What, what should I do? Should I wait or should I proceed? Everything has its pros and cons. So let me show you, for, this, for example, again, this is my patient who also had a central perforation, but this patient actually presented to me late. Like uh, he, he, he was not my patient from the start and he presented with a stromal infiltration and with central perforation and he went to many uh, doctors and all refused to do him the surgery, saying that it is a poor prognosis and the patient had visual acuity of PL. And they will, and by the way, when they have a patient with visual active PL, you are expecting a poor prognosis. And so uh, what will be the options here? Actually, we don't have any option. Like uh, we have to do a keratoplasty, but the, it's a problem with the prognosis. And again, the problem here with healing, like the edges here may not heal very well. But I did him again, a graft, cornea graft, it was eccentric. I did a little bit eccentric graft. And uh, the, core, the graft healed, and uh, the, the, the first post-operative visual active was 160, and the patient is doing well as well. Dr. Bushra asking about the Boston keratin prosthesis. We don't do with the Boston keratin prosthesis except for uh, severe ocular surface problems. Like if the patient, um, if the patient has multiple graft rejection, this is one indication. And second indication, if the patient has a like scarred co a conjunctival surface and the corneal surface as in OCP or Stephen Johnson or chemical burn with total stem cell deficiency with nothing to implant from the other eye. In this case, we, we, we don't do corneal graft because there is 100% failure rate of the corneal graft, either because of loss of a stem cell or either because of poor ocular surface with severe dryness that will cause affection of the graft. So in these cases, we do Boston keratoprothesis. However, the survival for the Boston keratoprothesis itself like it's four or five years. The maximum patient I saw was seven years. It doesn't stay more than this. That's what that I was talking about, Dr. Mustafa. This is, um, this is the rationale that we are thinking about. We have two, uh, we have two sides of the story. If, you, if a patient has perforation, he can develop endophthalmitis. So you are rushing for the surgery. If, the, if, you, didn't, if you didn't manage him and you give him an opportunity, you will, go, you will give him a better uh, a treatment or better healing process. So I think that uh, if you are treating this patient, if you say, yeah, like, like this patient I'm presenting to you, I give him an opportunity for two weeks. Like I give him medications for two weeks, waiting for any improvement of the edge, any recession of the stromal infiltration, something to, uh, to improve the prognosis of the surgery. However, I found that there is no response. So I did him the surgery, didn't wait much more than this. Okay, <laughs> you have been like two hours in the first case. Wow. For this patient, sir, we need a B scan or no need to B scan? Yes, of course. Yes, I did give this patient multiple B scans. So I do, I do him B scans every visit, like every uh, two or three days. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, an exam should we mention uh, uh, anti glaucoma medications only for impending perforation or even for a normal corneal ulcer? Should we mention it uh, while management, sir, in exam? No, no, we don't mention the corneal uh, equosuppressants for normal corneal ulcer, unless if the corneal ulcer is complicated by herpetic uveitis. Is it is herpes causing herpetic uveitis with the rise of the interocular pressure? So we give we add the anti glaucomatous other than this for normal bacterial or fungal, no. So we only give in cases of rise of the intraocular pressure. We give it on need. Okay. So, uh, so similarly, uh, steroids uh, should we mention or only when they ask we should mention so steroids and treating uh, corneal ulcers? Well, you can you can mention it, but we you, you would say that I will consider. I don't say I will give. I will consider because it is already well written in the books. 
so I say I will consider steroids in some cases of um, if the patient has a favorable response with, with intact epithelium and uh, well clean, uh, signs of healing, and we say what are the signs of healing, I will consider the steroids to facilitate and fasten the, the inflammatory process. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, Dr. Boshra, what is the role of cross-linking for non-healing also? It will be, it was found that this combination of riboflavin and uh, vitamin B, uh, and uh, sorry, the riboflavin and the ultraviolet rays is killing for the bacteria and the fungi and the amoeba. Actually, I have a very good experience with the uh, cross-linking for amoeba specifically. Uh, so I may show you some cases in the, in the group of uh, some amoeba patients who showed no response to any medication but the only healing happened after cross-linking. But don't say this in the exam, like don't say cross-linking for the bacterial keratitis or any infected, infected keratitis, because this is out of the scope of the exam. Okay, let's now check for the next case. Yeah, proceed. Yeah, sure. So, uh,